that was loud for no reason. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Um, as always, we'll kind of go through a couple quick reminders. Uh, today, lecture's a little bit funky because we have a little precursor to like the actual material we're gonna cover. Um, that's this little precursor is it on the quiz, but it'll be really helpful for the assignment that opens up on Friday. So keep that in mind. Um, one thing that's not on these reminders that I have neglected to remember to say something about, uh, remember that next Monday is Labor Day, which means you do not have class. Don't show up here. You're going to be really, really lonely if you do. Um, so just keep that in the back of your head. Honestly, I don't think it's going to be that hard to remember the fact that you don't have to come here. So, but just so that I, you can't say I didn't warn you. All right, so as a quick reminder, remember that quiz two is due on Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Um, I, again, remember that please, I wouldn't wait till the last hour to do it because that's usually when it seems like everybody has tech issues, whether those be real or not. Um, so, you know, try to be on top of those things. It's just covering the stuff from this week. Um, so it shouldn't be anything too crazy. Next week, what's even nicer is you're only going to literally have one lecture's worth of material on it. And, you know, after Wednesday, you can take it, you can use it as prep to be able to study for your exam. That's that following Friday. So, see if this will actually work today. Um, if, unless shit hits the fan, um, our tentative plan for exam one is again September 10th. It'll be in here. It's gonna be on Scantron, so that means bring a pencil. And again, it's gonna cover those like first six chapters or so. So everything from just like the introduction to what science is, to what is biology, to what is life, to the molecules and the chemistry stuff that we've talked a little bit about the last two days, as well as finally getting out of that stuff and doing cells and photosynthesis and respiration. So that kind of stuff. Um, does anybody have any questions? about any of the material so far that we've covered that's gonna be on the event. So we'll probably talk a little bit more about this on Friday. Remember your first connecting with science assignment is coming up. I think I released it to everybody on, the, on Friday. It's a pretty straightforward assignment. I think you could probably do it if you were really trying to push through, um, get it done in like three, four hours at most and you have a month to do it. So not really a whole lot of excuses to not do it. And again, the, all three assignments add up to about 15% of your grade. It's not a test grade or anything like that, but it's the difference between an A or a B. Um, I really highly encourage y'all to make sure you are doing the assignments and doing the quizzes and stuff. I know it's kind of tedious and they're kind of a little bit of, it feels like busy work sometimes, but I promise it'll be helpful for you to do well in the tests, especially considering most of the tests is straight from the quizzes. So it's, you get practice with it now while it's all open notes. And then for the exam, it, you're on your own, you know? So take advantage of that. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with our first kind of little mini lecture series here. And that's just, you know. Yes. So they're both called dipeptides. Um, it's those two in particular are kind of funky because there's not a true vocabulary where, where you have like monosaccharide versus polysaccharide or anything like that. Um, I saw one more question over here. Yeah, I believe so. They should if if you're not able to look at them. Keep in mind the one quiz I'm not able to do that with is the one on Wednesday. That or this one for this quiz three, and the reason for that. Is it still technically due on Sunday? So if you wanted to, you know, do it after the test, I don't see why you would want to, but I'm not going to change the due date for the quiz, but they're only getting like five questions from that last lecture. So it, if all else fails, they, I bet you if you just copied and pasted that question into Google, you probably can't figure it out. Um, anybody else have any other questions? Cool. And I know this isn't on the test, but you know, make a point to actually look into this stuff because it'll be really, really helpful when I ask you to read a scientific paper here next week. All right. 
Now, scientific papers are kind of structured very systematically. Um, they have a very, very specific structure to them. You may not have every single one of these sections, but they're usually laid out in exactly this order. You have a title and author section, which is just a couple lines that just gives you the title of the paper and who wrote it. Authorship's really important in science, and it's something that you'll probably hear a lot about at some other time. Um, abstract slash summary, 250 word max, um, usually, summary of what the paper is about, going from an introduction to discussion. So it's a nice quick way to, if you don't wanna read the whole paper initially, read the abstract and then go back and hit the highlights before you read the whole thing straight through. The introduction, which just kind of gives a basis for what's going on in the world prior to this study, as well as why this study you know, is happening. Uh, material and methods, how did they do this study? Results, what did they find? Discussion, how do our results explain real world phenomena? Um, and then acknowledgements, references, figures and tables are more just there to like help explain the results that you have or something about your methodology or just giving a general thanks. Like I know for most of my acknowledgements, I thank my wife because she has to put up with my bullshit while I'm writing them, you know? Mm -hmm. So what I really recommend first is you're going to skim the entire paper. You're going to look at the major headings. Do they follow this anatomy that we just mentioned, right? Um, how many figures are there? What kind of figures are they? So are they gels? Are they graphs? Are they microscopic images? Are they just pictures of the study organism? Because sometimes people just like to look at the critter. And then you want to ultimately look at what is the conclusion of this paper. And the best way to do this I've found over the years is to read through the abstract completely just read it you know top to bottom and then go straight to the discussion and look at the figures because you're going to pick up a lot more information from that and that'll help you because let's be real here y'all are not interested in science necessarily you don't need to know the definite ins and outs of every single word of the materials and methods but it's more important to understand the gist of the paper and why it's doing what it's doing why does it matter then you're going to go through the vocabulary anything that doesn't make sense to you just underline the words and try to use the context for it while you're reading through it initially. And if all else fails, Webster's Dictionary, your biology book that um, you may or may not have for this class. Um, there's a lot of other places you can look some of these things up. Wikipedia is your friend sometimes. Um, don't you know write papers from it, but at the same time, like it's gonna give you a nice quick entry to pretty much anything you need to know anything about. But the big thing here is in this step two, you're not really reading the paper for comprehension just yet. You're just making sure you have an understanding of the words. So that way you can, you know, you can't understand the whole body of the picture if you can't understand um, what a single word means in some cases. So in other words, you can't understand the forest if you can't understand what's going on at a tree level. And again, you're going to look up the simple words and phrases. Again, all these different methods are a way to do that. Um, note important phrases that are part of the major concept, concept that are bigger than just vocabulary, like risk reduction, um, ecology, some of the more like just basic fundamental stuff. You're going to need to know that in order to probably understand the whole paper. Um, one thing that I've tried to do when I picked out these papers, so the way this assignment is going to work is you're going to read a paper and just kind of have to translate it into like a tweet or a TikTok video or YouTube or something like that. Um, you're going to have to be able to understand what's going on in that paper, right? And you don't need to know the, the definite ins and outs of everything perfectly, but you do need to be able to summarize it. So it's important to understand these, you know, bigger picture concepts. And because of that, um, sorry, I'm just brain dead today. Bear with me. <laughs> but the, the big point I'm trying to get to here is that, you know, these bigger picture concepts are going to play a fairly large role. Then you're going to read each section for comprehension. In the introduction, you want to simply know what is the accepted state of knowledge in the field at the time? What data led directly to this work? What are the questions that these scientists are trying to answer? And what are they expecting the conclusions to be? Your hypothesis, if you will. You're going to get to the materials and methods section, which again, you're going to read the methods first and read them as you'd read the results. Um, and with each experiment slash figure, you should be able to explain the basic procedure, the question it sought to answer, the results, and the conclusion. You should be also able to explain all four of these to any sort of classmate or anything like that. 
whether it be through Twitter or whatever. And finally, you get to that discussion section. What conclusions do these authors draw based off of their results? What kind of things are they pulling in? And then describe for yourself why these why this data is significant. So this is the papers that I picked so far. Um, there's like five of them on there that you guys can pull from, or if you have something else you want to use, that's fine too. Just make sure I see it before you use it. Uh, Cause I know some of y'all are like psychology majors and might want to pull from a psychology paper itself instead of doing something from biology or just do animal behavior or something. Um, they're not super dense. I tried to pick ones that aren't gonna just be way over your head. They're pretty straightforward. Like, hey, we found a new species at X, Y location, or there's something really weird going on with red wolves when it comes to their genetics, that kind of stuff. And finally, you're gonna look through and reflect on this stuff and try to figure out if there's any criticisms that you might have of the paper, that kind of thing. You won't really need to focus on this step too much for what we're doing in today, but this is something that'll be useful for just in general if you ever have to read a scientific paper again. General tips for success, spend a lot of time on each paper now and look up every detail that you're unsure of. And the big thing that I've always found really helpful is imagine yourself teaching this paper or figures to someone else. You're gonna learn a lot more by trying to teach because you need to have a fairly basic understanding of it yourself than you are by just like trying to sit there and read it and absorb it a million times. Also really helpful when you're trying to study for exams. Uh, a lot of this stuff isn't too important um, for what you're doing for the purposes of this class. But again, some more tips for success that might be beneficial for other times you're reading scientific papers. Um, this top one I think is kind of important. Read papers when you're awake and interested in reading. Don't try to like force yourself to do it at like two o'clock in the morning, the day before the assignments do, after you've had a month to do it. Um, and plus, if you're already kind of interested in something, try to stay in that general related area. So, you know, if you have an interest in psychology, maybe pick if you, you know, want to do something biology focused related as far as like papers go, pick an animal behavior paper. There's plenty of those out there. And there's some really funky ones out there that do weird shit. It's cool. All right, let's actually go ahead and jump into our actual lecture for today. Um, for some of y'all, this is gonna be very much reviewed just like most of this has been, unfortunately. For others, you know, some stuff of this might be new to you. Um, if you really wanna feel old school about it, I'm sure there's probably an episode of Magic School Bus or something like that, or Hank Green and John Green do some really cool stuff on like side, side channel on YouTube. There's a lot of different ways that you could also reinforce this information. But as we've kind of talked about previously, uh, cells are the smallest unit of life. That's that primary base form of life. You can't be anything below that and still be considered life. A cell is the smallest unit of life that can function independently. Every living thing is made of at least one or more cells. We have somewhere in the neighborhood of millions. Um, and that doesn't include the millions and billions of bacterial cells that also exist with it inside of it at any given time. Now, biochemicals have to take place inside of the cell to carry out these basic functions of life, whether that be for supporting a much larger organism like ourselves or just being a single-celled organism that needs to exist on its own. Now, all cells come from pre-existing cells. You cannot create a cell from its components, but you can modify existing cells to do something completely different. For instance, like insulin producing bacteria. It's a genetically modified bacterium that's been implanted with some genes to allow it to produce insulin for other circumstances. We couldn't just make a bacterium to produce insulin. We had to modify an existing one. And we'll talk more about that, why that is in a little bit, but so far we've never been able to create life out of nothing. It has to come from somewhere. Now, most cells are way too small to see without a microscope. Many have to use things like electron microscopes, which are for very, very small particles. Um, light microscopes are used to view an entire cell more often than not, especially with things like vertebrates or plants where you have fairly large cells. But again, you're gonna have to use electron microscopes for things like individual parts of cells or very, very tiny cells that viruses. Um, and that's what, and what that electron microscope allows you to do is increase the magnification to like a million times what you can see with the naked eye. 
Now, all cells are going to share some common features. So regardless of size, all cells have genetic material, right? Because you got to be able to evolve, right? Like we've talked about in order to be life. They're going to have ribosomes, a cytoplasm, and a cellular membrane. These structures are all needed in order to properly carry out all the chemical reactions that you need to function as a living organism. Now, different cell types can characterize or can be characterized into three different domains. Some features are common for all three domains, kind of like what we mentioned, where you have all cells have to have a cell membrane, right? But others can only be found in one domain. Things like the nucleus and animals and plant cells that only exists in eukaryotes. We're the only group of organisms that binds their DNA up into a nucleus so that way it can be better protected. Bacteria and archaea don't do that. Uh, and each domain can also have a, a unique combination of these features. That's how we were able to actually differentiate archaea from bacteria, because they're totally different. They look very similar. They look kind of like just boring little circles underneath the microscope, but chemically and morphologically, they are completely different. And we just weren't able to see that until we had the tools in the late 80s, early 90s to be able to differentiate those two groups. Let's get a little bit more into those three different domains that we kind of mentioned a couple lectures ago, but this will go into a lot more detail. The first one is just called the prokaryotes. Now, prokaryotes are the most ancient form of life. They're small, simple in structure, and lack a nucleus. Bacteria and archaea are part of this domain. Uh, so it, it's kind of funky where you've got like the super domain that includes both of them. But in general, just prokaryotes can be divided into archaea and bacteria. Now, these two used to be together at one point, so that's why they're kind of lumped together in that prokaryotes category. But in 1977, this was changed, and it, it had a lot to do with like looking at the capsule and the membrane composition, which again, we weren't able to do until that point. And then you have your other main domain of life, the eukaryotes, as we've kind of mentioned previously. Um, these have evolved billions of years after prokaryotes, so your first prokaryotes start showing up around two to three billion years ago. Eukaryotes don't show up until almost one billion years ago. Uh, they're larger and much more complex with many internal parts. So that's where you get all to those little organelles that we're going to talk about a lot more in depth and include things like a nucleus and other membrane bound organelles. Protists, fungi, plants, and animals are all considered eukaryotic. Let's take a look at the anatomy of a bacterial cell here. Again, remember that bacteria are prokaryotic, which means they lack any membrane-bound organelles, and their ribosomes and their DNA are just free-floating within the cytoplasm here. So it just kind of like a big circle with a bunch of goo in the middle and just all these little components just kind of floating around. And then they have all this stuff on the outside that helps them either move around or interact with their environment. Things like flagellum, which helps them swim, a cell membrane that's going to help protect them from things outside of the cell. So walls and capsules, which even further help with that. And then everything on the inside of the cell is just to process energy and to continue becoming you know, more and more cells. But here you've got something like an animal cell. So notice how quickly they look completely different. Yeah, it has you know, similar stuff on the outside of it. But when you look on the inside, you see all these little like sub circles and all this kind of stuff. These are those membrane bound organelles that we were talking about. Things like the mitochondria, you know, the powerhouse of the cell. I feel like that's been way overused as a meme at this point, but it is what it is. Uh, obviously the nucleus, things like the Golgi, the vacuoles, um, chloroplasts when we're talking about plants, pretty much anything that's gonna be kind of membrane bound within the cell itself. And we'll talk more about this, I'm sure at some other point, I don't remember if it's in this lecture or another one down the line. But a lot of this stuff is thought to have been because somewhere down the line, some bacterial cell decided to eat another bacterial cell. Instead of completely, you know, breaking it down and turning it into energy, it let it just kind of exist within that cell. And so that's where you get this, it's called the endosymbiont theory. In other words, it's kind of like your gut microbiome a little bit, but on a much, much broader scale where um, what's really cool, if you look at mitochondria, it has almost completely different DNA that's present in the mitochondria versus the rest of the nucleus. And it's only passed from maternally. 
um, because of the size of sperm cells are usually too small to actually transfer it. Neat stuff. And finally, the anatomy of a plant cell. Again, plants are eukaryotic. Kind of like bacteria, they also have that cell wall. That cell wall, especially when plant cells are turgid and filled with water, is what gives them their structure. Yeah. So basically what happens is anything other than like an egg cell is what carries that kind of When sperm undergoes spermatogenesis, they go from like the base form of cell to a little half moon cell that can penetrate into an egg cell. The thing that it loses a lot of what makes it make sure. It basically goes down to just being a bunch of motor proteins and DNA. It's almost more it, it almost acts more like a prokaryotic cell than it does. So it loses mitochondria, it loses all that kind of fun stuff. It's really simply designed to get DNA from A to B. We got a good question. But getting back to the plant cell, um, like a bacteria, it's also going to have a cell wall, and that's what can give plant cells a lot of their structure. Because mind you, except for things like trees, which have a very different structure that we'll talk about a little bit later, um, even basic plant cells, all their structure is based off of the stuff that sits right in between the very close connections with their cell walls. And so that's why, if you've ever noticed, if you have like a house plant, um, I know some of y'all probably became plant moms and dads during, uh, you know, the pandemic last year. You'll notice if you haven't watered it in a while, it kind of flops over and browns over. That's because it's missing that water to hold up those cell walls and keep it nice and rigid. And again, that's all based off of that large central vacuole that's going to hold water inside of it. The other thing I want to point out, and this is something we'll get into a lot more later, is those dark green organelles that are kind of off by themselves. Those are what we call chloroplasts. That dark green color comes from a special pigment that's used to help break down sunlight and turn it into usable energy for the plants. Now, eukaryotic cells divide their labor. So things like the cell membrane are gonna be involved with pro, um, you know, protecting the cell and whatnot. Um, but organelles are gonna be involved in protein production and protein localization. In other words, moving proteins around the cell uh, cellular digestion, so breaking down uh, sugars and uh, using, I believe, oxygen to turn it into water and carbon dioxide and releasing energy from that process. You're going to have energy-related organelles. And a lot of eukaryotes, you're going to have cytoskeletons that are going to help hold that uh, cell together and keep it nice and rigid, as well as help move things around the cell. And then finally, you've got the structures outside of the cell that might help them move around. Kind of digging into the membrane a little bit first. Uh, the cell membrane is going to be just simply a membrane that surrounds each cell. And the cell membrane's primary function is to form a barrier between the cell and the outside world. That's what allows it to maintain homeostasis. That consistent condition that's required for life, that's what does it. And it's also going to help with regulating the passage of substances in and out of the cell. And that's primarily done through um, transport proteins and ion channels and things like that, that based off of what the cell needs, it'll create these things, embed them in the cell membrane and allow certain nutrients to come in and push other nutrients out. Now the base of the cell membrane all comes back to these phospholipids, which is a specialized kind of lipid that makes up the majority of cell membranes. Um, what's really neat about this is it's both polar and nonpolar. So not only can it handle the polar world of dealing with water and whatnot, but by being polar on one side and nonpolar on the other, and then backing each other up. So you have two of these phospholipids sitting where you've got the, the polar side and the polar side and the two nonpolar sides. That's what gives you that consistency. Now, a phospholipid is made up of a molecule of glycerol, a phosphate group, and two fatty acids. So pretty straightforward. And like I was mentioning, it's amphipathic. Amphi meaning dual. So if you've ever heard the phrase amphibian, dual life, that's where that comes from. Um, it means that they're both polar and nonpolar, like I just mentioned, where you've got that hydrophilic head, which is going to allow for polar bonds, which are attracted to water, 
but those hydrophobic tails like we talked about with um, lipids in general, allowing it to have nonpolar bonds, which help to repel water. In other words, basically creating this perfect circumstance where it's almost like a plastic bag. It's going to keep water on one side and you dry on the other. Now these cell membranes are going to get put in together into these phospholipid bilayers. So you've got one phospholipid up here and one phospholipid down here. And because of their chemical structure, phospholipids spontaneously form this bilayer when they're surrounded by water. And that's what helps to, you know, probably what helped to create life at some point. You had this very kind of spontaneous production of all these phospholipids. They all get kind of put together in the way that they were. Now, because of this barrier the way it is, it helps to separate that cell membrane from this outside, from the rest of its surroundings, where you're able to keep water inside of the cell and keep water that you don't want inside the cell outside of the cell. Additionally, it also helps to keep out certain um, concentrations of different nutrients. So if like you have a really, if you want to maintain a really high concentration of something inside of the cell, it's easier to do. Ultimately, a phospholipid bilayer is selectively permeable to lipids and small nonpolar molecules. Now, like I mentioned, these cell membranes contain protein, and these membrane proteins are embedded throughout the bilayer with different membrane proteins carrying out different functions. You have things like transport proteins, enzymes that help to break down things that are existing on the outside of the cell or the inside of the cell, recognition proteins. So in other words, a bacteria can recognize its own kind, if you will. Um, adhesion proteins or receptor proteins. All these have different purposes. We're not necessarily going to go into the specifics of them, but just know that this is a bunch of the options you're going to see when it comes to proteins on the outside of the cell. Carbohydrates can also protrude from outward from the cell membrane. And these chains of sugars are attached to some of the proteins and the phospholipids in the cell membrane. And that's what's going to play a key role in cell-to-cell -cell communication. Because in other words, if you're just a cell floating out by yourself or you're a cell working inside of a eukaryotic organism where you've got a bunch of you together that have to do one specific goal, you have to find a way to be able to communicate between the two or it's not going to work. This is especially really helpful for things like the immune system so that can it recognize its own cells and not attack them. Um, this is kind of a problematic thing because when it doesn't happen, that's where you get things like allergies, right? That's when your immune system is attacking something that it thinks is a foreign body that's dangerous to you and it tries to get rid of it. It mounts such a strong response that you get things like sniffles, anaphylactic shock, and even death if you're not careful. These proteins also contain steroids. Cholesterol is a great example of a membrane steroid, and membrane steroids help to keep the membrane at the right level of fluidity and not too soft or too stiff. It's also, in addition to the cell membrane, have a, a, a wall outside of it, which helps to, again, shape and regulate cell volume and prevent bursting when the cell takes in too much water. Now let's kind of dig get away from the cell membrane and we're going to talk about the organelles involved in protein production. Uh, this is primarily controlled by the nucleus and eukaryotic cells, where the nucleus contains DNA, which specifies the recipe, the blueprint, if you will, for proteins. And it also contains the nucleolus, which helps to synthesize some of the ribosomes. RNA is synthesized in the nucleus. Uh, so basically you're going to take DNA, it's going to get read out, it's going to turn that information to mRNA. It's kind of almost like you're downloading something from a computer. If you've got the blueprint online for everything and you only need a single page, that's what the mRNA is. And then after leaving the nucleus, this RNA is gonna bind with the ribosomes so that prote uh, protein synthesis can, can occur. So basically you're gonna go from DNA to RNA. That RNA is gonna attach to the ribosome and it's gonna assemble the um, proteins based off of what it's reading in that RNA. More specifically, proteins are synthesized on the ribosome itself with these free-floating ribosomes synthesizing proteins that will function in the cytosol, whereas ribosomes attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum synthesize proteins that function inside organelles or outside of the cell. Let's look at proteins of, uh, involved in, uh, or sorry, let's look at uh, cells 
uh, organelles that are involved in protein localization. You have the endomembrane system, which is going to help move molecules around within the cell. This endomembrane system consists of a nuclear envelope, endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, the lysomes, the vacuoles, and the cell membrane. After synthesis, proteins are going to enter that rough endoplasmic reticulum, which is all this kind of like. Um, where they're going to be modified and folded into the exact 3D shape, getting that tertiary and quaternary folding like we were talking about the other day. And then they're going to be put into transport vesicles, which are going to help move from this stuff from the rough endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus, which is a stack of membrane sacs that act as a processing center. So inside the Golgi, proteins are chemically modified to become more or less functional, depending on what is needed for the cell. These proteins are then going to leave the Golgi after they've been processed and are going to be sorted and packaged into new transport vesicles and then moved to where they need to go onto the cell or outside of the cell. So let's look at organelles involved in cellular digestion. This is the lysosome. It contains hydrolytic enzymes. In other words, water cutting enzymes. It's going to be what helps break down things that you don't no longer need within a cell. Uh, some transport left vesicles are going to leave the Golgi, carrying these enzymes that catalyze hydrolysis reactions. Y'all should know what hydrolysis is by this point. And these vesicles fuse with the lysomes where cellular digestion of large molecule occurs. So in other words, you're going to send, if a cell is kind of functioning, it has these large molecules that need to be broken down. It's going to send them to the lysomes. The lysomes are going to have these little um, transport vesicles carrying the hydrolytic enzymes. That's going to be what's there to break down those larger molecules into smaller molecules so that the cell can use them. And again, keep in mind, all this stuff is, is only occurring in eukaryotic cells that have all these extra membrane-bound organelles. Um, in prokaryotic cells, it's done a little bit differently, and we're not going to get too specific into that because it gets really into the weeds, depending on what kind of bacteria you're talking about. Now, one of the things I kind of mentioned a couple times already is that plant cells have extremely large central vacuoles. And because of this, most plant cells actually lack lysomes. And their cell digestion is going to occur in these central vacuoles, which is also going to help regulate the size and water balance of these plants. So here you can actually see an example of it. There's a huge plant cell. All of this is the vacuole. This is the cytoplasm cell. You have more in the vacuole itself than you do in the cytoplasm. Of course, all the wonderful little green dots here are all the lots where all the photosynthesis is occurring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's pretty much interchangeable at that point. You also have peroxisomes, which help to break some toxic substances. They aren't always. It just kind of depends on the organism, on how many and how they're designed. Um, these are primarily there to aid in digestion, and they originate at the endoplasmic reticulum and contain enzymes that are going to help digest and then oxidize certain toxic molecules. So keep in mind, too, while most things are considered you know, non-toxic, things like oxygen, water, whatever, um, those kinds of things aren't considered toxic in this case and are probably not going to be broken down by peroxisomes even though they are considered toxic at high levels. So it's, it's more so for specialized breaking down of little chemicals, not just because of the overabundance of chemicals. And mind you, being a chemical doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing, just that it's some sort of you know, chemical compound or molecule or whatever. All right, let's get to the energy-related organelles. Of course, if we can't go talking about any sort of organelles without mentioning that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> All right. I promise it's the last time you're going to have to hear it. Um, so the mitochondria is designed to harvest energy from food. So almost all eukaryotic cells have thousands of mitochondria, which are maternally inherited. Remember, um, we talked about how the egg cells are where those things are coming from. And so even in cases of asexual reproduction, as long as that egg cell is being produced, that's where that mitochondria is coming from. Um, and cellular respiration is the process that happens in here. And we're going to spend almost half of the lecture just explaining what cellular respiration is 
and how it works. But the big thing that you need to keep in mind here is during cellular respiration, you're taking in oxygen and you're taking in some sort of simple sugar. You're undergoing a chemical reaction where you're cutting things and then undergoing something called the Krebs cycle. And as a result, you're gonna end up with uh, two byproducts and something called ATP. ATP is that center energy molecule that's used for pretty much all chemical reactions within the cell. And those two kind of waste products are CO2 and water. That's why if you ever notice when you're sitting here just breathing in this room right now, as you take in oxygen, which is only about 20% of the air you breathe, and you breathe back out carbon dioxide and a little bit of that humidity that's coming out of your lungs, that's your body getting rid of all those waste products from all the stuff that your cells have produced. So breathing is basically as much as you know, part of the waste removal process as much as it's you know, bringing up and gain energy. It's not just eating, right? Now in plants and a lot of algaes and other protists, um, chloroplasts can also help to harvest energy from light. So these are very, very specialized cells that are only found in eukaryotes, again, because they're membrane-bound organelles. And kind of going back to that whole, uh, video, or sorry, the symbiotic um, relationship theory that we've talked about previously today. Um, in the theory, the way it's thought currently, is that some sort of prokaryote consumes another prokaryote and create a mitochondria, which allows them to generate energy through cellular respiration. In order to run cellular restoration, you also need to be able to produce enough sugars to feed that factory, right? It's kind of like if you've ever played games like Factorio or a lot of like Zoo Tycoon games and stuff like that, you have to have that central location where all the food is coming from to be able to go out to the exhibits to be able to eat, right? Um, Basically, it's the same kind of concept here. It needed that extra organelle to be able to produce the energy and not just have to rely on consuming things. So that's where these chloroplasts came from. It was another likely um, photosynthesizing cell that was eukary or prokaryotic that got consumed by a uh, eukaryote that had recently gained the mitochondria. And now you have two former cells essentially living within inside of a plant or you know, just a plant, plant dish cell because not all plants have chloroplasts and not all things that have chloroplasts are plants. It's kind of not just like that, unfortunately. But the thing that what these chloroplasts are primarily there to do is it's an organelle that's designed to convert energy from the sun and carbon dioxide into stored sugar molecules. It's taking all of that carbon dioxide, interacting it with sunlight, and turning it into the C6H12O6, which I believe is glucose off the top of my head. Now keep in mind too, this is not the only way to generate independent energy like this. There's also chemosynthesis. We're not gonna to get too far into the weeds on that as well, but that's primarily gonna be done in either prokaryotes, and there's some, some eukaryotes that do it, but they're highly specialized organisms that live at the bottom of like, the, you know, the Marianas Trench or something like that, where there is no other energy coming from any other source. And finally, we're gonna get into the cytoskeleton. Now, the cytoskeleton, much like the skeleton in your body, is going to be a little bit of a being supported by being able to move. Uh, by extending and contracting their cytoskeleton, it's what's going to help them kind of move around. It's like, if you ever seen like a needle move, right? it's got this glob that just kind of exists. There are other you know, ways to do that as well, or you can have some sort of membrane, uh, or some, some sort of membrane, or cellular membrane bound proteins. And, uh, or a flagellum, they're gonna help push you that exists as basically a giant protein that exists outside of the cell. But the cytoskeleton is gonna help for a lot of other things as well. The additional structural support is gonna help with cell division because one of the things that makes life is you have to be able to continuously produce more life, right? And as well as they're gonna help with organelle transport. So anything, all that um, membrane proteins, to move things from one side to the other, those transport uh, membranes. 
the thing that we attach to the cell or to the parts of the cytoskeleton, and they have proteins that mix through the little. If you've ever seen videos of like the locks and stuff, and you know, the Central America the Panama Canal, or going through the UK, you have these tiny little boats that, because it, it'd be too much to like power them from the boat itself, they have like ropes coming off of it and have to say a train, or back in the old days, they used to use like mules to do this. That's the kind of thing that you're seeing, where you've got this big thing floating through the cytoplasm with a string attached to it with a protein that's just kind of slowly moving along. And again, it's going to help with cell movement. There are three different kinds of uh, elements of the cytoskeleton. We're going to have microfilaments, which are going to be composed of actin proteins, intermediate filaments, which have varied protein composition, and finally, microtubules, which are composed of tubule, uh, tubulin proteins. And all three are connected together and function together to create this intricate meshwork. As we kind of mentioned a couple times, you get things like cilia and flagella. Uh, these are microtubules that make up the structure called the cilia and the flagella that protrude out from the cells are primarily protein based, like we've mentioned. And think it's not just used for traditional movement. Like obviously you think of flagella you think of sperm because it's you know, a single little tiny packet of DNA on a giant flagella. Almost tadpole looking, right? But it's not just confined to those. You can have many flagella coming off of a single organism, or you get these more hair-like things. But these can be adapted for other purposes. So the cells inside of your lungs or inside of your um, large and soft, or sorry, large and small intestines are going to need to use those cilia to help move things through your gut or move things through your uh, respiratory pathways. And particularly for things like in your respiratory pathways, they're gonna help push particles like dust out of the respiratory tract. So that way they can't just sit there and harbor bacteria or viruses or whatever, and allow it to just continuously reinfect your body. All right. That's kind of the general rundown of some of like the just broad categories of organelles. Um, the big thing here that I do wanna point out though is Remember that in order for a eukaryotic organism that's multicellular to survive, it has to be able to communicate, to be able to function with all these other cells. And there's a wide variety that they get to be able to do that with. And so here's some more like, examples of that. But the big thing is, is you've got some sort of connection between one cell to another that allows it to basically communicate some basic information about the environment that they're in and how they need to react to it. So something like these in the cellular organisms, such as these bacteria, have to communicate so they can not only continue to survive in these particular circumstances, but allow them to divide into much larger groups of bacteria, right? Because they're often these maternally clonal uh, colony of bacteria just replicating over and over and over again. And so it's beneficial for you as a single bacterium within that colony to promote the good of the colony. It's kind of like uh, if you've ever seen the movie uh, Bugs Life, where it's all about focusing on just trying to get that whole body of an organism together and functioning as a single organism instead of all these little individual ants. In multicellular organisms, it's becoming even more and more complex. Probably the most classic example of this, and probably one of the most complicated examples of this, are neuron cells and brain cells. These are very, very highly specialized cells that are designed purely just to simple, send simple electrical signals from one side of the body to the other. But if you didn't have those, I wouldn't be speaking up here. I wouldn't be able to communicate to you all, right? So one thing to keep in mind with all of this is they're communicating, right? But it's not like it's thought processes or anything like that. It's just cells based off of protein signals and all the stuff and stimuli in the environment responding to those stimuli and letting all these other cells know. There's not like a guiding process behind it. Um, yeah. 
it kind of depends. Like, I mean, it depends on what kind of cells you're around and how, how you're interacting with them. Because honestly, if you're trying to say, avoid other cells, right? You're not gonna be sending out signals into the world of, hey, here I am. Because uh, for instance, it's probably like one of the classic ways to get yourself eaten. There's entire species of predators. I know this is a, a you know, little bit example, but there's entire species of frogs that have learned to not call at specific frequencies because if they call at them, bats will come and pick them off. They're like perfectly in that detectable range. So they've had to modify, like it's, it's this really weird bimodal thing where they have super low deep um, calls or super high pitch calls. They completely lost that middle range because they're not trying to advise or advertise themselves as being there when they're trying to reproduce. And it's similar kinds of things with bacteria. It's just not as, just not as directed as, as probably the best way to put it. Now, plant cells primarily communicate through something called the plasma desmata. This is the channels that pass through the plant cell walls. And nutrients and biochemicals can actually travel through these channels as well into adjacent cells to help to inform the entire you know, cellular matrix of all these different cells together how to respond to particular circumstances. Meanwhile, animal cells are gonna to stick together. They're gonna to use these adhering or anchoring junctions to hold themselves together to other uh, cells and self. Um, you're gonna have tight junctions, which form an impermeable barrier to other between cells, so nothing can pass through it. Um, you have anchoring junctions, which attach cells to extracellular matrix, so the tissue can withstand mechanical stress. And you have things like gap junctions, which are tunnels where ions and small molecules can pass through. For example, a great example of this is uh, nerve cells. They have a little bit of a gap junction between all the other nerve cells, so that way they can pass ions between them a little bit easier. Remember that eukaryotic cells are highly specialized. So in multicellular organisms, cells have to divide up all this labor, form together to form all these different tissues. And so as a result, you have very, very specialized types of cells within a eukaryote to carry out different functions. And so that results in some things are not always present in every single cell. Like, and red blood cells in humans, we don't have a nucleus in them. So if you were wanting to go full Jurassic Park and clone something from you know, mosquito blood or whatever, um, you couldn't use blood of mammals because there's just not enough genetic material there. But, it's in re but in reptiles, they still have a nucleus for whatever reason. All right. That being said, don't forget, again, do on Sunday. Make sure you complete it. Um, please remember when you're in here and you're sitting next to people, please wear a mask. I've had 15 to 20 people already since the start of the semester come down with COVID in this class alone. Not trying to scare you, just putting that information out. Oh, just wait. You too. Give me just a second, y'all, and I'll step down there. Let me end this real fast.